Now we start looking at the most powerful type of sequential logic circuit, and that is known as the finite state machine. Uh, finite state machines, also just abbreviated uh, state machines or FSMs, are, it's a sequential logic circuit which can make decisions on its outputs based upon prior states that it has been in. So <clears throat> the prior states are dictated by prior inputs and, and also prior outputs. But this allows us to build a system which can can look into the past essentially. So if you think about it, let's just let's just draw some some circles that would represent some some state that it has been in. So let's just say that some some <clears throat> set of inputs caused the, a machine or or this circuit to go to state zero. And then once you know you're in that state, maybe another input, maybe the input being a one, caused you to go to a different state. So we'll call that state one, and then maybe a different input on that when you're in that particular state caused you to stay in that state. And let's just say that you went through a, a series of states, and for each of these states you're producing outputs. So you think about the power of this type of approach. It's, it's a simple concept, but it's these finite states, these defined states that the system can exist in. and when you are in one of them, the input will then allow you to transition to another state, and then based upon being in this new state, inputs will cause you to transition to another state, and et cetera, et cetera. So at any given time when you're in a state, what you know is that there was a history of events that caused you to get there. So you had to have a, uh, some condition, some input you know, sequence that caused you to be where you are at that moment in time. And by knowing that, by knowing your history, and by knowing, you know, what the current inputs are, you can make a very intelligent decision in terms of what the output should be. So your outputs no longer have to look at just the instantaneous values of the inputs. They can look at the log of the inputs that you have seen for all the states prior. So that's the power of a finite state machine. And what we're going to start with is we're going to start looking at just describing the functionality. Okay? And the functionality is based on this idea of finite states that this circuit can exist in, <clears throat> and then transitions between states that are triggered by inputs. Okay? And then after that, we'll look at synthesizing it. So there's basically three ways to describe the functionality of a finite state machine. The first, you always start with a word description. And then what you do is you move into what's called a state diagram. And a state diagram kind of looks like this, <coughs> this drawing that I did right there, except this is really not, this is really sloppy. And then we go into what we call a state transition table. And all of these just simply take the, the system that you're trying to build and they, they describe the functionality in an increasing level of detail that gets you ready for the next step, which would be a set of steps that you would do to synthesize <coughs> the finite state machine. And then we'll do that in a different video. Okay, so let's start off. One of the best ways to learn how to do this is to look at an example. So let's look at a class, uh, an example of a, not a classic one, but just an example of a finite state machine. <clears throat> and, and actually, it's not even a description of a finite state machine to begin with. It's more of a description of something that requires a finite state machine. So let's look at this word description. We're going to use this very simple example to walk through all the steps from the description of what we're trying to build all the way to the final logic diagram of the finite state machine. <clears throat> and so we'll go through this in a little bit of detail here. So what we want to do is design a system that will allow a user to open and close a window with the push of a button. <clears throat> so imagine that a window uh, it has a motor connected to it that can open it and close it. And the motor takes in two logic levels. So <coughs> it's, got a, uh, it's got a signal called clockwise CW that will open the window and that spins it in a clockwise manner. And then it's got another one called counterclockwise or CCW and that'll spin it the other way, counterclockwise, and it'll close the window. <coughs> so you think about this motors on the window and, you, and you're going to build a system which will produce these two logic values and you're either going to open the window by asserting CW, close the window by asserting CCW. But the trick of this is that the user is only going to have a single button. So when the button is pressed, it will 
cause the window to either open or close. All right. So now if you think about that project or that design description, <coughs> you have a scenario where when that button is pressed, you have to know whether the window is open or closed. You have to know where the, the window has been. So this immediately motivates the need to use a finite state machine. <coughs> because what we can do is we need some way to store the current value that the window is in, and we'll store that as a state. And then based upon the state you're in, you will move to another state, which which will do the appropriate task. So for example, if we had a state that represents the window is closed, <coughs> and we are in that state, the button is pressed, we know that that button press means open the window. And how did we know it meant open? It's because not only was the button pressed, but we were in the closed state. Now what would happen if I was in the open state? So the window's open, that same button got pressed. I saw a logic level come in, but I knew this time that I needed to close the window and that was because I knew what state I was in. So this is a very simple, simple uh, finite state machine motivate, motivated problem, okay? And we'll use this throughout the entire process because it's very simple. <clears throat> so if you think about the system, we're gonna have a button and we're gonna, if we have a press is equal to one, it'll cause the system that we're gonna build, the finite state machine, to do whatever it's gonna do. And if it's not pressed, it'll be a zero. Now what it's gonna do is it's either going to assert the CW line or assert the CCW line. And to make the signals a little bit more descriptive out of the finite state machine, I'm going to call them open underscore CW. So that means <coughs> I'm going to open the window by asserting CW, or I'm going to close the window by asserting CCW. So the input is going to be called press. And then notice that I have a clock coming in here. And you'll see why once we go to synthesis, synthesize this. It turns out that a finite state machine is, is a sequential logic circuit. So you are going to have sequential devices in here. You're going to have D flip-flops that are all triggered on the rising edge of a clock. So we always want to write that clock in there. <coughs> okay, so that's the, basic, uh, that's the basic overview of this. Now we're going to simplify this problem so that we don't, so that it's something we can do in a manageable amount of time. So here's some of the conditions that we're going to do. First of all, all you need to do is assert CW and the window motor will run long enough to open the window. So we don't have to worry about holding CW open you know, or CW asserted for a long time or for a couple seconds that it does it. We just send a one there, take it to a zero, and we assume that the window is open. Same thing with the motor uh, spinning counterclockwise. We don't need to hold counterclockwise until the window is closed. We'll just send a one out there and then that's it. And we just assume the motor will do what it needs to do to close the window. <clears throat> we also don't want to ever assert these two together. So if they're both zeros, the motor is off. CW, it is asserted, or open CW is asserted, the drive CW, it spins one way. Same thing, it spins the other way on this other signal. But if you assert both of them, <clears throat> we don't want to have that case. Okay. So the first way that we can describe the functionality of a finite state machine, we just did the, actually the first way, but that's the word description, is by doing what we call a state diagram. Okay, now a state diagram, it's a graphical way to list out the algorithm that we are going to implement. <coughs> so for this example, let's go ahead and we know we needed to have two states and one of them is going to be the open state, and one of them is going to be the closed state. But let's do this with a state diagram. So this is going to be a state diagram. <clears throat> okay, so now a state diagram consists of states and transitions, and the states are going to be represented by circles. So in this situation, we are going to build a machine that <clears throat> has two states. Circle is a state. What we do with the circle is we need to give it a descriptive name representing the state that we are in. Now remember, all we're doing right now is describing the algorithm. Okay, We have a word description, we're going to describe the algorithm. We're not going to worry about ones and zeros right now, or D flip-flops, or any circuit implementation. We just want to make sure that we can describe this functionality in the, the form of a state diagram. <clears throat> the state diagram is kind of where you design how you start building this machine. So we decided, let's call one state W closed, and let's call the other one W open. 
So W closed is going to be the state that we would be in if the window is closed, and W open will be the state that we're going to be in when the window is open. Okay, so this is window closed, window open. I just chose those names, completely arbitrary. Now what we're going to do is those are the states, so those are the only two states we're going to have in our machine, and now we want to do the transitions. So based upon any, or based upon being in a state, we want to look at what the inputs might be and how that would cause us to transition. So now we're going to look at the inputs and we're going to draw the transitions as arrows. Okay? So let's go ahead and let's think about, I'm in W closed. The input into our system is called press. And so what would happen if I was in the window closed state and press was asserted? Well, I would move over into the window open state. So what I would do is I'd say, I got a button press. That means press was equal to 1. And I needed to do something to the outputs. I needed to assert the outputs and then move into the W open state because then I needed to know that the window was now open. What would happen if I was in W closed and I didn't get a press? You know, press is a digital value, so it can either take on a 1 or a 0. So we also should list what would happen if press was not pre not asserted. So this would represent press is equal to 0. <coughs> Notice we just stay in the current state. And that's perfectly fine. So that's perfectly fine. Okay, so now we know that we're going to have outputs for these transitions, but we're, we're going to put those in there. We'll put those in as the last state or the last step. Now let's go to a uh, state diagram, or excuse me, the uh, window open state. And what would happen if I'm sitting over here? That means that the window's open. Okay, that's the state that this represents. I am going to now list out all transitions based upon all possible values of the inputs pressed. So what would happen if the button was pressed? Well, I would then assert the appropriate output signals to close the window, and I would move to the W closed state. So I have now press is equal to 1. I move that way. And then what would happen if I was in the window open state and press was not asserted? I would just stay there. Now at this point, you kind of start thinking about, well, when do I transition? Well, I'll give you a hint of, or a preview of what's going to happen. These states are held as unique binary codes. Well, the only thing that we have to hold a binary code is a D flip-flop. So what we're going to do is we're going to encode these states with ones and zeros, and they'll be held on a D flip-flop. Then what state we go to next, or what we update the D flip-flops with, <coughs> will be formed by some combinational logic. But when we make the decision on whether to transition, we're going to do that by updating the output or updating the state code held on the D flip-flop. That is done on the rising edge of a clock. So we will be in a state, and we will evaluate on each and every rising edge of a clock whether we stay or whether we move. So in a, in a machine like this, if we're running a clock, that let's say we're running at a, a megahertz, you know, you might make a decision a million times to stay where you are over and over and over, and very rarely might you actually open the window, but it, it doesn't matter. As long as we have the path in here to know what to do when the press is not asserted, we're fine. So this is now the state diagram, but we have one final thing to do, and that is put in here the outputs. We've defined the states, we define the transitions, and now we need the outputs. So let's start with the easy ones. I'm in a state where press is not asserted. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put in parentheses the outputs. And I have two outputs that I can, that I can uh, assert or deinsert. I have open CW, and I have close CCW. And I'm going to have both of those just sit at a zero. And I put them in parentheses to note that they are outputs. When I just put the input signal name equals a value next to the transition edge, then I know that that's an input. So I put parentheses around them to, to just show that it's obviously an output. OK, then over here, if I'm in the open state and press is not asserted, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm not going to assert the outputs. So I'm going to say open CW is equal to a zero and then close CCW is equal to zero. All right, so let's do these ones. So now I'm in the W closed state, and the, the press button was asserted. In this situation, I need to open the window. So now what my outputs are going to look like is I'm going to do open CW is equal to a 1, and then I'm going to do close 
CCW is equal to a zero. So when I was in this state, press was asserted, so I asserted the appropriate outputs in order to open the window, and I moved to the open state so that I knew that the window was now open. Same thing down here. If I'm in the open state and press was asserted, what I need to do is assert my outputs accordingly, and in this situation, the window was open, so I need to close the window and move to the closed state so that I know it was there. So this is what a state diagram looks like. It's a set of states. You decide how many states you need. You add states as necessary until you have the functionality you desire or the functionality given in the word description. And then you put transitions ba at each state based upon the inputs, and then you list the outputs for each and every input code. So this is a state diagram. Now, we're going to begin synthesizing this. So what we want to do is we want to start putting this in more of a table format because we're going, to be we're going to be synthesizing combinational logic, and when you do that, it's nice to have things in a truth table form so that we can, we can use our direct synthesis techniques that we learned prior in order to directly implement the circuitry. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a state, state transition table. And all this is is the exact same information as is given in the state diagram, but it's going to be in table format. And when you do a state transition table, uh, we're going to start off by just writing in just the names right here, but once we go to synthesis, we're going to go back in and we're going to add in codes. So when you, when you do this over and over, you'll learn to kind of make the state transition table big enough so when you can come back and insert stuff in it. But for now, let's just go ahead and, uh, and write it out. So we have current state, and we want to list it as there's a column in here, so we're going to have current state, and we can be in W closed, and we can be in W open. But then we also want to list what the inputs were, which in this situation it's press, and what we really want to do is we want to list what the next state is in addition to the outputs. <clears throat> so for this output, we have two outputs, and what we'll do is let's just write them in here. So I'm going to have open CW, and then I'm going to have close CCW. And now notice that when I'm in W closed, I can have two possible values for the inputs. So I can have a zero and a one. So I really need to go back and, and list current state twice. So I really needed to do it like that to have the table complete. Same thing down here. I can have an input. When I'm in W open, I can have the input press be either a zero or one. So I really need to complete the table by doing that. So now what I do now is for my next state, for each current state that I'm in, for, I can look at the input value and I'm going to list right here where I'm going. So if I'm in W closed and press is a zero, I'm staying in W closed. And that represents this transition right here. If press is asserted, I'm going to go over to W open, and that represents this transition. Now if I'm in W open and press is not pressed, I'm going to stay in W open. And then when I'm in W open and press is asserted, I'm going to move to W closed. So this is the exact same information, except that it, it's in tabular form. And so now let's go over here and let's put our, our outputs in here. So I know that when whatever state I'm in and I get a zero on the input press, I'm not going to do anything. That means it's unpressed. So I can go ahead and fill those ones in. But what if I'm in W closed and I get a press asserted? So I'm over here. What I want to do is I want to assert open CW and not assert close CCW. And then when I'm in W closed, or excuse me, when I'm in W open, and I get a press, I want to assert close CCW and do nothing with open CCW. <clears throat> so at this point, we are, we are done describing the functionality, okay? We've done it, we had a word description, we had a state diagram, we had a state transition table, and from this, <clears throat> you always go through these steps. 
to get to the point where you're in a tabular form. Now the state diagram was a design step. So you could have designed this, you could have added more states, you could have subtracted states, had different types of transitions. The state diagram is really where you're designing your finite state machine based upon the uh, word description. When you go from a state diagram to a state transition table, all you're really doing is trying to put this in a table format so that <coughs> you can directly synthesize. But at this point, we'll stop and we'll come back and do a full video just on synthesis.